Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the first ever Love on VR weekly product update. Uh, I'm very excited that I get to have my own show uh, because I can, you know, give you a bit more depth on what it's like to create a, a VR app from from scratch. Uh, so. What should we speak about uh, this week? We should speak about uh, what I've done last week, I guess. That's sort of the, the topic of the videos. So what I've worked on last week is architecture, uh, the architecture of the product. Architecture might be dismissed uh, by some of you as sort of a boring technical uh, concept, but uh, even if you're not a developer, it's extremely important to, uh, to understand uh, how important architecture is uh, when it comes to, uh, to a product. To give you an example, that I learned that the hard way because uh, at my previous company, Housetrip, some part of the app was uh, quite badly architecture. I remember we had uh, one part of the app called the inbox where users would message uh, each other. Uh, on that uh, wasn't well architectured at all. Um, and so doing the tiniest change uh, to the inbox will take weeks of work. Like even the function functionality of, uh, of a button, changing the functionality of a button will take weeks of work uh, because um, it was you know, so complex to understand what did what and uh, what the consequences of changing something will be on the rest of the inbox. Uh, whenever you made a tiny change, it would just break everything. Uh, so it was a, a complete nightmare for our developers. I think uh, we even had a couple of developers quit because we had them. We asked them to uh, change a feature on the inbox. It was it was that bad. Uh, and it was bad for us uh, as a business as well because. Uh, you know, if if it takes your developers weeks to change the functionality of a button, uh, that means that um, you're very slow as a company, and uh, on speed is important. You, you want to to be, you know, the fastest to uh, to to develop the the product for for your users. Otherwise, your competitors will, will catch up with you. Uh, so I've tried to do things right uh, at uh, Love and VR. And so, for instance, last week uh, you might remember that I shared with you that it took me only four hours to uh, uh, adapt Love and VR to the HTC Vive. So that's an example of uh, where I did things right for the for the architecture because I uh, <coughs> abstracted the handling of VR devices to, to this uh, piece of code right there uh, that I call VR setup. So only my VR setup code is in charge of understanding the particularities of each device. So for instance, on the Gear VR right there, uh, to click, you need to press there, right? On the side, you watch like that and you press there. On the HTC Vive, you have those things in your hand um, to click, uh, you typically press there, right? So my choice for the architecture of, uh, of our app was I could either have all the objects in the app that need to understand that the user click uh, be customized for whether it's a Gear VR click or HTC Vive click and so on and so forth. So um, uh, basically have a different uh, behavior for each object, whether uh, I use the Gear VR or the HTC Vive, or alternatively, I could have only one piece of code that understands what a click is on each device, and then just tells all the other objects in the app the user clicked, uh, and all the other objects don't care what device the uh, the user uses. Uh, and obviously, that is the better architecture uh, because that means that uh, if down the line you want to add another device, uh, or I do want to add another device, I also want to make the uh, app uh, compatible with the Oculus Rift, for instance, I only need to change that one piece of code, uh, VR setup, and the rest of my app uh, still, we only know that the uh, user clicked. They won't. They still won't care what on what device the user clicked. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. 
why did I work on architecture last week? Well, I noticed that one part of the app I didn't do well when it comes to architecture, and that was how I code the database. So every app out there, well, most apps out there use uh, a database. Uh, that's where we at Love and VR uh, store our users' data. Uh, so you know we get quite a bit of data from users be it uh, their email, their <coughs> username, their, their photos, uh, profile description, and so forth, so on, so on and so forth. Um, and so we store all of that in a database, and then whenever the app wants uh, data on the user, they code the database. The way I did things, which wasn't very smart, um, I had uh, a lot of different objects in the app uh, code the database. Uh, and I think that that setup, the reason why I went for that is uh, is a bit down to Unity. Uh, by the way, that is Unity, uh, that software right there. So it's sort of the leading software that you use to create a VR app or any type of, uh, <coughs> of 3D application. And in Unity, they don't really uh, hand guide you. Uh, when it comes to uh, to those things like coding a database and so on, there is no clear architecture that you should go for. So, so it's sort of down to you as a developer to, to figure it out. Uh, whereas when you um, when you develop a website, you're hand guided. Uh, typically, you go for what's called a MVC type of architecture, and that's very well established. Uh, MVC stands for Model View Controller. So only controllers uh, get to code the database, and then the data they get from the database they give to the view, and so on. That's very uh, sort of organization. You don't have the equivalent for for handling databases in, in Unity, and so I saw. I guess I I fell in the in the trap, and uh, of course uh, did things wrong. Um, and so the way I did it uh, until I realized my mistake last week was I had. Um, uh, a lot of objects in the app uh, called the database. So, for instance, my screen right there, uh, where my computer right there was calling the database, the floor uh, was calling the database, my bungalows were calling the database, and so on and so forth. I sort of realized uh, at the beginning of last week that if ever I wanted to change the way my database interacts with the, with the app, uh, I will need to go and change each one of those those objects, which, which will take me a lot of time. And also, I had no uh, uh, centralized uh, place where I could understand uh, what code the database went because it was, you know, all over the app. Uh, so that was wrong, uh, obviously. And so I spent uh, most of last week changing that. So I created uh, an object that's called uh, that I, I called uh, data controller. Um, I know I'm very creative when it comes to names. Uh, it's just an awesome, awesome name. Um, thank you for the prize. So my data controller, you can see the code uh, right there. So. Everything that has to do with uh, fetching data from the database, uh, posting data to the database, or changing data in any way, it's all in there. Uh, so you can see you know, there is one function there, which is a download image, uh, uh, one function which is login, one function change the number of favorites for the user, uh, uh, Add a, a view profile, a profile view, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's all in there. And so whenever any of my objects in the app want to query the database, they ask the data controller to do so, and then the data controller sends the data to that uh, object. Uh, I think it's a, it's a much better architecture, uh, if that makes sense. And also, I get to have a unified uh, view of. Uh, all the different functions uh, that uh, that come in the database, it, it's all on that one uh, sheet of code. Uh, so it, it's much more clear to, to me as well, and also much easier to, to change down the line. 
So I guess uh, I guess that's it. I hope it wasn't too technical. I, I tried my best to um, uh, to not make uh, things too hard to, to understand. I hope you liked it, uh, and I really look forward to see you next week. Bye. Thank you.